look, here's the food as medicine idea, the tool in the toolbox we started talking about that clearly is something that can be done not in the doctor's office, but in the patient's home. Food as medicine, that's a big topic for you. A lot of people are talking about the potential to use food. We all eat two, three times a day, right? Food as medicine, that's such a powerful idea with such broad reaching and important implications. How do we, you're a medical doctor, how do we use food as medicine? Yeah, well, you know, so I want to first touch on my background as a doctor because most doctors aren't educated about nutrition. And when you see somebody who's a doctor who talks about food, oftentimes you're seeing somebody who is abandoning their ship and saying, yeah, don't worry about the medicines anymore. Now we're actually just going to eat kale. And, you know, I actually think that there is a new frontier that really respects food as really just another tool in a toolbox for us to stay healthy. And on the medical side, that's really, I think, probably the most even keel of all, which is that, you know, here we are, we've had 70 years of pharmaceuticals and there's gonna be more, another 70 years ahead of us. But the thing that's been missing is how, what do we do with food? And, you know, how do we develop the evidence that you can trust hmm. based on science that we can actually then use to apply both from a clinician's perspective, a doctor's perspective, and also to really, um, to help not just patients, but healthy people as well, not become patients, let's say. Now, the idea of food medicine, by the way, is also, um, I think, uh, starting to grow a little moss on the side. And the reason is because more and more people are kind of coming into this idea and talking about food as medicine and utilizing it. So, you know, I'm sort of like one of the OGs of food as medicine because I actually study food in the same systems that we do drug development. And so, um, so I, and I, so I take that craft of doing that very seriously. Um, and, and because of that, I want your, uh, your viewers to know that for me, what I'm happy to always talk about is what do we know and equally, what do we not yet know? Because mm -hmm. that's really the mark of a scientist. You know, people that say they know everything, uh, we're all set with the microbiome. We're all set with antioxidants, you know, like those are not scientists, real scientists are really upfront by saying, here's what we know. And here's what we don't know yet. But think about how we would study that. And so that's really kind of where I'm actually coming from. So food is medicine. Look, um, both things that we put into the body, in, in, the, in the case of medicine, pills, injections, what have you. In the case of food, we're just eating it. But once the stuff is inside our body, our bodies respond in certain ways. So when we feed ourselves or treat ourselves with things that are harmful to the body, man, do we have a bad reaction. And when we actually put good stuff into our body, well, hopefully we have actually been mindful enough to add the good things that our body's going to respond well to. And so what I actually do is not only study the food, but also study how the body responds when you put inside it. I got to give you credit because studying nutrition is much more difficult than studying drugs, right? When you have a drug, when you're studying a drug, it's a single compound, right? Food is not a single food. There's no food that's comprised of a singular compound, right? right? And, and yet nutrition is much less well-funded than drugs. That's right. No, well, you know, like it's interesting. If you take a look at the amount of money that food companies, the food industry invest towards advertising, even if they took a 10th of that and actually started to apply it to uh, research, it would actually really start to build momentum uh, where we actually need it. Now, Drug companies spend billions of dollars on research, and they're actually relatively restricted on what they can actually market to. Now, there, there's not that much they can actually market. I mean, they spend a lot of money in marketing as well, but it's really almost the inverse. Pharmaceuticals get some marketing, but a ton of R&D, research and development. Food companies get almost no R&D, but they get tons of marketing. And so you're really talking about two worlds that have this gulf between them. And the kind of work that I do in food as medicine is try to bridge that gulf to say, look, uh, you're absolutely right, Max. You know, food is complex, complex, right? Um, uh, from a science perspective, uh, and but it it has been understudied. So how do we actually get um, uh, tear a page from the playbook? Of pharmaceuticals so that we can actually get that kind of evidence uh, that we want. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the goal of medicine is to 
should be to heal the body. I mean, I think oftentimes today medicine acts as a mere band-aid uh, to treat the symptoms that that we may um, be experiencing, right? When we present to our to our physicians. Um, so, in that sense, can food heal the body? Can food be used to heal a broken body? You know. So here's the thing. This is really when you pull the cloak off of the sculpture which is the human body, what you find out is that the body actually heals itself. And that's what I wrote about in my uh, book, Eat to Beat Disease. And I think that's why it became a New Times bestseller is because it's really the first time that people really said, you know, there's a lot of foods that can do this, but let's take a look from the vantage point of the body. So how does the body heal itself? I think that that's really something that um, once we lock that down, then we can talk, then, then we can go into the bounty of the of the of the farmer's market or the grocery store to figure out like all right what can we, what can actually achieve that it's a it's turning it's upending the way most people do it right so most people go here's my superfood and it's going to cure x y and z it's not about that it's really about okay so what do we need to do to stay healthy how does the body heal itself well there's five health defense systems in our body they are hardwired these health defenses repel disease and we actually develop these health defenses while we were in our mom's womb. So when mom's egg met dad's sperm, about five days later, these this ball of cells that was our primordial uh, me wound up developing a jaw, an ear, a liver, a hip bone, toes, okay? At the same time, at the same, with the same process, our bodies develop these hardwired health defense systems. It's kind of like the, the operating system of our body, you know, so while the, the case and the hardware is being built and the keyboard is being built, the operating system that's being installed into us when we're at nine months of age, popping out of the womb, we have all these health defenses. And by the way, this is actually uh, uh, why we don't get sick as often seriously when we're kids, hmm. right? So when we're adults, middle age or, or even older, people go, man, why did I get arthritis? Or why did I get dementia? Or why did I get cancer? Why did I get diabetes? You know, and then it becomes sort of like the, bad person, guilty, you know, kind of game. Like it really messes with your mind. I like to actually ask a different question. Not why do we get sick, but how come we don't get sick more often, right? Hmm. You, and, and the answer to that is because, well, actually, we usually do pretty well over the course of our lives, most of our lives, because our body's health defenses are activating. So what are these five health defenses? You've got blood vessels, angiogenesis, our circulation defends us from disease. You've got stem cells that heal us from the inside out. They actually replace parts of our organ that are broken. It's kind of like taking your car to the shop. You need a new spark plug, no problem. Stem cells come right in and put a new one in. Third is our gut microbiome, which I think is sort of like a new frontier, right? So today they announced at this big global press announcement, like we just discovered and took a picture of the black hole. I don't know if you saw that in the news. I right? saw that because one of my favorite musicians uh, posted it. He, he He's known for a song about uh, black holes. And um, so he, he shared it. So that's how I saw it. But yeah, very remarkable. Remarkable, right? I mean, like 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 humankind changing. Well, I can tell you that, you know, the, the whole idea about the gut microbiome, our bacterial selves is kind of like this earth shaking idea that we're not fully human. So, you know, we're not the Terminator, but we're not fully human either. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, the, we don't, the machine part of our cyborg is actually bacteria growing inside our body. And when I was in medical school, by the way, uh, uh, you know, I can tell you second year medical students and even first year medical mm -hmm. students are told that when we study microbiology, that's a study of organ, microorganisms, we, were, we, we had to memorize uh, chapters of all the bad bacteria that we want to kill and get wow. rid of. And that's really how doctors are minted with this idea uh, burned into our head that must kill bad bacteria. Okay. And in fact, the reality that we have now is that most of the bacteria associated with humans is good. There are relatively few bad guys that are out there. You know, it's kind of like going into your perfectly peaceful neighborhood. There might be some ruffians living in some of those houses, but you do not burn the whole neighborhood down to try to get them, right? So now we're actually completely reversing our thinking about bacteria, one of our health defense systems. There's also our DNA, more than a genetic code, our DNA um, uh, is programmed 
hardwired to fix itself from damage. When I talk about damage to the DNA, here's some simple things, right? So you're in Los Angeles, you got beautiful sunny days and you're stuck on the I-10 in traffic for hours at a time. I know I've been there before, okay, <laughs> in that traffic. And you, you know that you shouldn't be on that beach that you're driving, you're stuck in traffic by, because if you were out there for hours, you would get sunburn, which would cause mutations to your DNA and increase your risk for skin cancer, which could be fatal, right? right? Now, here you are with the window down and the sun shining into the same ultraviolet radiation is pounding you in the face and burning your arm up for an hour, maybe more, without sunscreen. So how come we don't actually get uh, skin cancer just being stuck in traffic? Because our DNA fixes itself. When it gets damaged by ultraviolet radiation or radon from the ground or off-gassing from your new carpet, okay, uh, or the fumes from the detergent uh, coming out of your washing machine or dryer, yeah, the DNA gets damaged, but it fixes itself, a huge defense system. And then finally, our immune system. And this is an area I've really spent a lot of time over the last couple of years diving more deeply into is this new frontier about our immunity. Now, I'm not going to talk about COVID because I think we've all talked enough about it, but I will tell you where my point of view from immunity is. Our immune systems, when right-sized and given the chance, is strong enough at any age, including old age, to wipe out cancer, hmm. even cancer that is spread to your brain. Okay, So the game over kind of situation need not be over if you can actually get your immune system to do the right thing. And this is where all these hardwired health defenses are really changing our conception of what it is that we're able to do. We're starting to look, think about health less as this passive state that you know we get to enjoy until fate crushes it with you know some unfortunate disease, and then we got to go to the doctor or we got to go to some alternative medicine. What I would say is that, look, you know the food that we eat every single day ministers to our body and activates our health defenses, and those health defenses, when they're supported, they are firing in all cylinders helping us resist disease. And that's how we live long and prosper. That's the through line. So that's how food truly can act as medicine by supporting each of these five different defenses. Yeah. So let's, let's pick apart a few of them. So bacteria, I thought that was super interesting that you said that the vast majority of bacteria that we're exposed to are actually beneficial bacteria. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, and, and it's really kind of something, um, a, a powerful contradiction to how most of us grew up even as kids, right? Like your kindergarten teacher, your mom told you, you know, don't touch that. It's going to be full of bacteria. You know, oh, don't eat that because it's going to be contaminated. The, the five second rule in the restaurant, oops, dropped on the ground. That's going to be contaminated. It's got bacteria on it. Look, um, most uh, we're inhaling bacteria. If you are and I in the same room having this conversation, we'd be exchanging bacteria that gets aerosolized just from our conversation. So we actually swim through a sea of bacteria that we inhale and we swallow. And they most of them comprises an ecosystem inside our body. By the way, um, I don't know if you know this, Max, but um, uh, uh, humans are a understatement as a name for what we are, okay? Mm. If we were coming from outer space, you know, and, and we did a, 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 we jumped from another universe into, into the one we have now and then zoomed onto earth. And we were uh, looking through our ship and our screens and saw, you know, that bipeds, two people, people walking on two legs, you know, wearing clothes. We would not call them humans. You know what we'd call them? If we really knew what, if we really knew what was inside us, we would call these two legged walking individual <laughs> figures, holobionts, H-O-L-O-B-I-O-N-T-S, holobionts. That is a proper term for a meta organism uh, that is composed of lots of smaller organisms. Wow. That's who we are. We're not even human anymore. We are really holobionts. Okay. Holobionts. It's, How, it's, what what it's is deep, the origin right? of that word? I mean, can you, can you break it apart? Like it's. Uh, it, it is actually an ecosystem. Wow. Of multiple organisms that live as a whole. As a whole. Wow. Fascinating. Right? So. So, I mean, I wanted to bring that to your to your podcast because people need to understand just how powerful our gut bacteria is. So, you know, look, there's a lot of people out there that talk about, you know, take this probiotic and do, you know, eat my fermented food. And 
Yes, all of those things seem to be important. I'm a scientist and I'm a doctor. And so I want to see the evidence that this really matters, you know? Um, okay, so here's a recent study that came out, uh, it was published in the journal uh, Nature, uh, uh, Nature Medicine, and they were looking at um, uh, about 100 patients with malignant melanoma. All right, this is the skin cancer, the kind of skin cancer you get from, from sunburning or being in a suntan booth. And they were getting this kind of can new cancer treatment called immunotherapy. Okay, and immunotherapy um, is the most natural way of treating cancer you can think of because it's not chemo, it doesn't kill bacteria, it does not burn things. Uh, all it does is it activates your own immune system. So you, your defenses can do their job to wipe out cancer. Your immune system detects self, healthy self, and it also finds things that are not so healthy, whether it's a bacteria or a virus or a tumor. Okay. And when it finds it, it will just gobble up and start to destroy the cancer. Uh, and that's what immunotherapy is all about. Wow. Uh, quick, uh, uh, quick example, President Jimmy Carter, oldest living president in the United States. He's you know almost 100. Actually, he's in the late 90s. Okay. Um, when he retired from his presidency, he wound up with his wife building houses for, for homeless people through Habitats for Humanity. Like what an amazing uh, commitment to public service. All right. Except he was in Georgia doing it under this blazing Georgia sun. And he got melanoma on his arm. It spread to his liver, spread to his brain. And when his doctors diagnosed the metastasis, the cancer metastasis to his brain, they told him, look, buddy, this is game over. We can't this. There's nothing for you. Well, right at that moment in time, clinical trials were underway of immunotherapy, of which former President Jimmy Carter became one of the first recipients. And within a few treatments, by activating his 90-year-old immune system, his own body was able to wipe out all the cancer, including that that is spread to his brain. So here's a guy who wrote his own obituary, withdrew from public life, said he had actually lived a wonderful existence and he was ready to meet his maker. And bada bing, his immune That's system, defenses, basically took a dry erase, like it's like taking an eraser to a dry erase board and just wiped it away. All right. So, I mean, like, how, how come we haven't used that to cure cancer for every person at this point? Well, this is, we're at this revolution, like at this moment in time, Max, this is what different patients are experiencing. My own mother, because I heard about President Carter, got immunotherapy, exactly the same one he got. It's called pembrolizumab. And she had metastatic uh, stage four endometrial cancer, cancer, the lining of the uterus. And her oncologist, a senior guy, basically said, you know, same thing, take her on a cruise because there's the chemo is going to be terrible. And, you know, I, I looked, uh, you know, I looked at the oncologist in, in the eye and I said, you know, do you know what I do for a living? Like I'm, I'm all about innovation and this is, and we're at that point. And so we put her on immunotherapy and she got three treatments, never got chemo, three infusions, each infusion, three weeks apart. Okay, now we did something with her diet, which is, goes back to what my, my point. And she responded. She and all of her cancer went away as if you took a racer and just dry, wipe, wiped it off the dry erase board. Now, here's what, how, so that's the power of the immune system when given a chance. Now, what about the gut? Remember I told you, and the gut bacteria, remember I told you that, you know, here's this transforma transformational cancer therapy that is that, that leverages our most natural immune, our, our immune system, our defense. But our immune system is dependent, codependent in some ways on our gut health. Hmm. When our gut is healthy and our, we've got good bacteria working for us, it talks to our immune system. Now, why does that work? All right. Now you need to have a little, you need to have a little knowledge of anatomy here. So our gut is basically this long tube. So think about the garden hose in the summer, all coiled up, right? And, you, and it's connected to the, to, the, to the thing in the wall. And you've got lots and lots of coil. It's all coiled inside our body, about 40 feet. Now, longer than a Greyhound bus, okay? And it's all coiled, packed up inside there neatly, okay? It's one of those things, by the way, in surgery, um, if, you, if you've ever watched a real surgery and, and a surgeon has to go in there and dig something out of your gut, they pull all the guts out. Oh, Just, God. And then they got to pack it again. So you ever, you ever unpack your suitcase like in a hotel? And then you got to <laughs> pack it back up quickly? 
All right. It's not do, that easy. When they unpack it, do they unfurl it and then have to put it back into its con- natural configuration? Yes, sir. There so the surgeons it. know how to do that? Yeah. It's like packing a suitcase. It's it's wow. a thing you don't you don't see because it's it's a little shocking to actually see, but it's quite remarkable how you know this flap goes back, this piece goes on top of there. This one goes on top of there. I mean, it's like origami, but with your internal organs. All right. So that's insane. You got to have the right folds. Are the folds connected to one another via something? They sure are. You you don't, you may not know this. I'm, not, I'm spilling the beans of what people see in the offering. You open up your gut, okay, your, your, your skin and your belly. You've got this big apron. Okay. That you never even heard about because it's not in weightlifting magazines it's called the Omentum. And this thing is literally an apron that is moving like an octopus in our bellies. And it's made out of 100% fat. Wow. Okay. And this moving fat like octopus called the Omentum actually is loaded with our defense system. And what it does is it's continuously um, searching conducting surveillance, looking for problems in the gut. You know, in the grocery store now, you'll see these robots that are kind of moving around all by themselves. Well, that's what the momentum is. It's roving around. It roves around. It's called the policeman of the abdomen. Wow. Right. And this this policeman goes around looking for problems because if you had a hole in your gut, it could kill you really fast. So when it spots a problem, a leak, a hole, perforation, a problem in the gut, The octopus goes right there, wraps right around it, seals it off, and then really focuses the immune system to try to control and contain and heal things in ways that we wouldn't ever know. How incredible. The the body's amazing. So here's the thing, though. If you take a look at the gut and you were to cut the gut, uh, the intestines uh, in cross-section, open it up, it would look like a garden hose, the same thing that you actually had in, in, uh, in outside in the summertime. And if you look at the middle of your garden hose, it's, you know, it's pretty thick. It's got an opening in the middle. And in the wall of the garden hose, in the wall of our intestines, is 70% of our immune system is living inside the wall of our intestines. Now, in the whole of the intestines, okay, that's where the bacteria are. So the bacteria talks to our immune system because they are literally roommates, okay? And the analogy I give, remember in college, you know, like basically when you're a freshman in college and you've got, you're living in a dorm and the walls are always thin, you want to ask your buddy what he wants for pizza that night, you just yell it right through the wall, (laughs) Yeah. all right? What do you want your pizza, right? And so that's how the bacteria in our immune system communicate, all right? Now, when the bacteria are happy, they give good instructions to the immune system. The immune system will follow the instructions such as, hey, please go after those cancer cells, all right? We've got immunotherapy. When the gut is unhappy, meaning uh, uh, disorganized, the ecosystem's damaged, you know, you're having too much sugar, too much alcohol, too much red meat, too much processed meats, too much ultra processed foods, things that really upset our our gut, uh, you know, Look, all of us have been there. You know, you're eating some food and man, you know, you don't feel so good afterwards. Maybe for a couple of days, your your tummy's upset when you were a kid. That is, listen to your body, the holobiont, the, the, some of those other bacteria are telling you, man, it's, it's not happy. The neighborhood is like heating up, right? <laughs> and so the problem with that is that then your immune system isn't being communicated with properly. And so with the immunotherapy, what my mother got, what Jimmy Carter got, again, many other cancer patients now, it turns out these immune treatments work marvelously, amazingly, I would say, um, to really uh, help people overcome their disease, even in ways we never thought possible, only 20% of the time, 20% of the time. And that means that, I mean, celebrate the 20%. But 80% of people aren't actually responding the, the right way. So this paper that came out with 100 patients with melanoma getting immunotherapy found out that the people who were not responding, guess what? They had problems with their gut bacteria. Wow. Their ecosystem was messed up. And then they went and looked at the responders to say, well, what about the responders? What do they got that the non-responders don't have? Well, in this particular study, they found one bacteria. This one bacteria is called ruminococcus. Now, I don't want people to have to tongue twist 
uh, to remember that, but because it took me a while to, to figure out how to pronounce it. But Ruminococcus actually is one of these healthy gut bacteria that seems to talk to the immune system. And, and, uh, and, 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 and that's interesting, except some surprises that researchers found. They said, well, how many people were, with ruminococcus were taking probiotics, right? You'd think that if you're going to be a biohacker, take some more ruminococcus. Yeah. It turns out that the people that had ruminococcus were also eating dietary fiber. They were eating dietary fiber. They were getting fiber, pro prebiotics, which feed the gut bacteria, which grew the ruminococcus, and they had better results for the cancer therapy. They responded to the cancer therapy. Um, in fact, they responded so well that they could even calculate for every five to six grams of dietary fiber. How much is five or six grams of dietary fiber? That's the amount that you'd find in a medium-sized pear. Simple, doable. That's it. Five to six grams of, of dietary fiber in the size of a pear per day decreased mortality and tumor progression by 30%, three zero. Wow. Huge, right? Now, here's the big surprise. When they looked at people who were taking probiotics, they did not respond. In fact, some of them actually did worse. And so this just goes to show you how food is complex and food can help activate our health defenses. In this case, first our gut bacteria, then our immune system, so that our body can better respond to the other tools in a toolbox for healthcare. It's incredible. I bet most probiotics don't actually promote the uptake and the and the and the ultimate residence of the bacterial species that they contain. They, I mean, probably many get don't actually have live cultures. They probably get destroyed by stomach acid. So I, I feel like it's the fiber that actually is able to make its way down to that colonic ecosystem that is is going to help best promote the growth of that bacteria. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it's a, it's a bit of a mystery, isn't it? I mean, and I'll, and I'll tell you, uh, I mean, the simplest way to think about it is that if you had a neighborhood, like your neighborhood you'd live in, it's a good neighborhood, and you want to actually keep the neighborhood healthy over generations, let the people in the neighborhood reproduce and raise their kids there, right? You're going to get more of the same, the next generation going to take the values of the parents and so on and so forth. And they're going to, they're going to, it's, it's the community, they're going to take care of each other, right? Now, imagine trying to like probiotics is like trying to just bring a greyhound bus of people in from another city and just drop them off in your neighborhood and say, hey, go find a home. Yeah. All right. Some of them might actually find a place to live, but a lot of them are not. Right. <laughs> yeah. Some are going to get off the bus, look around, and be like, this place sucks. <laughs> and, the, and the prebiotics, by the way, Max, that's like bringing in the food wagon and just opening it up to feed the neighborhood, hmm. right? So that makes, that, I think that, you know, like maybe that is a simple simple analogy to help people understand why we wanna use food to take care of ourselves because our own ecosystem is so complex that, you know, it, 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 it probably is asking too much to manufacture a little pill that was filled with, you know, what we think are probiotics that can actually use them um, to, to be able to fix everything. Now, here's, now I will actually go the other direction because I'm a scientist. And, and one thing about science is that we're always, we're always surprised by the, the, the findings that we actually have ourselves. I mean, that's part of the fun. You know, anybody who's listening, who's thinking about a career in science, let me just tell you, science, once you get into it is really fun because there's always surprises. It's like Christmas at the end of every experiment or a holiday, you get to actually discover something brand new that you didn't expect, right? In fact, in fact, if you only found what you expected, it wouldn't be fun anymore. You know, uh, that's line workers, all right. <laughs> so, but 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 the the uh, so here's a, a, the, you talked about the um, bacteria not being viable. All right. So I asked this. I've always asked this question. So if you take a, a dry powder or pill, like actually I'm going to show you a, see if I have it with me right now. I don't, I don't have it with me, um, but like um, a, a little thing of probiotics, it's dry. It might even been sterilized by ultraviolet radiation to for pasteurization or whatever. How could that possibly be alive? You're eating basically dust, bacterial dust. Well, this is still part of the mystery. These bacteria never really fully die. They seem to reconstitute themselves. I don't know how, but even more crazy, if you were to take bacteria, and one that research was done was called Lactobacillus ruteri. This is a bacteria that's found in yogurt. It's found in uh, sourdough bread. It's found in Parmigiano Reggiano cheese. It's the starter for it. Okay, so it's a and it's a healthy gut bacteria. 
It's a gut bacteria that lives in uh, our colon and that um, when moms are about eight months pregnant, the bacteria, the bacteria can sense the level stage of pregnancy and the uterus pretty much lets the bacteria know. Your bacteria sends a text message to say, hey, I'm ready to move. And other blood cells go down to your, back, to your colon and pick up this bacteria like an Uber wow. and drop off the bacteria right in the breast near the nipple. Wow. So that when the baby's born, crawls up the mom, skin time, goes up to the nipple, takes a big suck, gets that lactobacillus right into their gut. Pretty awesome, right? Like, like we can't engineer that kind of stuff. Anyway, what I'm going to tell you is that, um, so lactobacillus, uh, they've actually studied this. You can take the whole organism, put it into drinking water in a lab and have lab rats drink it. And you get all kinds of amazing things. Immune system goes up, um, uh, wounds heal faster. Uh, the, the brain releases social hormones. So the uh, animals are friendlier. Okay. Now here's the crazy, absolutely crazy thing. You can take that bacteria before you put it in the water and you can subject it to an ultrasound. So this is like Marvel, the Marvel universe. You use ultrasound to completely fragment and blast apart um, uh, uh, the bacteria. So it's in millions of tiny little fragments. Put it back, put that in the drinking water. And guess what? You'll get the exact same response in the animals. Hmm. Heals faster, immune system goes up, social hormones go out. Wow, doesn't even need to be alive. So is it, so, so you know, I, I'm just telling you like, this, there, this is an undiscovered country. It's fascinating. I mean, but like, what would even be the proposed mechanism in that case? It's just parts of the cell? It may be fragments of the cell that are enough to actually trigger certain responses. Wow. It could be fragments of the cell of one bacteria that activate other bacteria that are already in your gut to do something else. You know, think about like, um, you know, like a, like a box of Legos, right? Um, you know, if, if you, you need one part to fit into another part to create a Batmobile or whatever it is you're trying to build or the space shuttle, the Empire State Building, like there are parts that we don't understand in our gut microbiome. And that's why, you know, I always tell people who are, you know, who want to know my view on this is that I'm super excited by the gut microbiome, obviously. I think it's super important. I've done research in it myself. But when somebody says, well, so are we ready for the stool test to tell me exactly what I'm what kind of food I need to eat and what my metabolism needs. What I would tell you is that, you know what? Not quite yet. Right. There's still quite a lot we need to learn before we can nail that down. And so while I applaud companies for trying to create these innovative, you know, kind of tests, I think it's early days yet for consumers. Yeah. Um, we don't know if that's a whole story. Go ahead and try it if you want. <laughs> Well, if so, if this immunotherapy is is really a, a life or death proposition for people who are suffering from metastatic cancer, and we know that the the microbiome plays a a role, um, would do you see then there being a role for fecal microbiota transplantation in the future? I mean, why not just take the responders and get some of their stool, right? Clean it put it in, transplant it into these, these non-responders and then run the immunotherapy again. So the research that will lead to a clinical trial of exactly what you just said is underway right now. So we're Amazing. probably a few ways, few years away from actually seeing that happen, but it makes total sense. I mean, look, you just, you just put the pieces together in a logical, what would be the next set of research steps? Yeah, that makes, that, that makes sense to me. You know, um, and by the way, there are some foods that can actually grow. There's another uh, research uh, uh, pro program that uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Laurence Zitvogel in Paris, she's an immuno-oncologist. So she's an oncologist, a cancer doctor who specializes in the immune system. She was looking at, uh, again, between 100 and 200 patients with all kinds of different cancers, all getting immunotherapy, of which 20% were the, um, uh, or thankfully, great responders and 80% were not. So this number of 80-20 rule kind of thing, you know, plays itself up in a wrong direction when it comes to immunotherapy. So we're mm. trying to figure out how do we tip the odds in favor of people to respond? Because it is really quite, I mean, I, I, I'll tell you, Max, I never thought in my own career, I would see a treatment that could literally erase cancer out of your body, but here it is. 
Okay. We treat, by the way, in my mom's case, we treated her for three treatments and all of her cancer disappeared. And then we didn't know what else we were treating. So, but we kept, we were afraid to stop. So we kept on going for another year until the oncologist said, you know, we haven't been treating anything. There's nothing left. Maybe we should stop. And that was seven years ago. And she's never had cancer again. Wow. So amazing. I'm, I'm just telling you, this is a real life story of what's actually happening. Now. So um, Professor Laurence Zitvogel found there was one bacteria that was found, a, a different bacteria than Ruminococcus, called Acromancia. We can talk about Acromancia. Yeah, that's probably the topic of a whole other uh, uh, podcast. But um, Acromancia, uh, which seems to be the key to obesity versus leanness, diabetes versus non-diabetes, but also response to immune system, uh, immunotherapy, was missing in the people who are non-responders. And so what was found is that there are certain foods that can actually stimulate your gut to naturally produce acromancia. What are those foods? Pomegranate, cranberries, uh, conquered grape. Why? Because they contain a natural substance, a natural chemical found in nature. Now let's talk about the food called elagitanins. And these elagitanins in pomegranate juice, conquered grape juice, and, and cranberries, cranberry juice, actually cause our gut to secrete mucus, healthy mucus. Okay, there's always mucus in our gut. How do we know that's the case? Well, if you have diarrhea, you see a lot of mucus coming out. Mm -hmm. But normally, we have need, also need to have mucus because if we didn't have mucus to allow the stool to slide, we wouldn't be able to go to the bathroom. It would, everything would be stuck. So mucus is healthy. And Acromancia's last name, this, the genus species part, is called mucinophila. It loves to grow in the mucus. So when you have pomegranate, uh, conquered grape, or cranberries, you create the mucus layer. That's like fertilizer for Acromancia. Lots of Acromancia grow. Now, in the lab, they found that you take animals that don't have Acromancia, they're not going to respond to immunotherapy. You feed them these elagitanins, their colon secretes mucus, they grow Acromancia. Now they respond again to immunotherapy. Another gut bacteria influenced by food. We talked about pears and dietary fiber before. Now we're talking about pomegranates, you know, um, will respond. And then the patient, whether it's a lab mouse or a human, actually will respond to immunotherapy. So yes, fecal transplants, I think, Max, are um, in, you know, it's an area that is um, uh, difficult to actually uh, study, but it's going on right now. But look, here's the food as medicine idea, the tool in the toolbox we started talking about that clearly is something that can be done, not in the doctor's office, but in the patient's home. So healthcare doesn't happen in a doctor's office or in the hospital. Healthcare happens between visits in our own homes. I couldn't agree more. And the suffix of egalitanins is obviously tannins, and tannins are found pretty abundantly. I wonder if they'd have the same effect. Tannins you find in, in tea, in coffee, in red wine. Yeah, well, so, I mean, elagitanins are a family of molecules of which there is a part of the molecule uh, that, that's called a tannin uh, that has a tannin component to it. So each of these um, uh, parts of a chemical name refer to part of the structure. Uh, so like polysaccharide, there's a saccharide or a sugar part, um, it's poly. So there's lots of pieces of it. So, you know, like people who are linguists, like love to get into these uh, tongue twisting names, but I would just say, you know, um, I try to simplify it uh, by the way, uh, to, to people like it's one of the things, by the way, I've been trying to do over the last couple of years is, uh, is to try to communicate to people that, you know, while there are all these uh, health conditions that we, we're not 100% sure how best to overcome, uh, you know, food is stepping up as mm -hmm. one of these interventions that is not even hidden in plain sight, but in plain sight. What we need to do is to be able to apply our knowledge. And, you know, when it comes to immunity, even if you don't have cancer, your immune system is wiping out microscopic cancer. So the reason people should want to actually have a strong immune system isn't has nothing to do with the pandemic has everything to do with the fact that you know if, if you want to actually be as fortified as healthy as cancer-free as possible in your life you want your immune system to be conducting surveillance like a cop on a beat to be able to spot all those microscopic cancers that might try to be forming but you want your immune system to destroy it so that's you know so I, i've actually created kind of like different guides for people there's a blueprint that i actually created like 
simple immune, simple ways that you can choose foods to actually uh, boost your immune system. And I'm sort of like just giving it away because that's what everyone should have. Yeah, where I mean, where is it available? By the way, oh. you are so great at what you do. I mean, this is why this is why you're you, and why you know why why you have such a such a huge book, and why everybody wants you on their podcast because you are so good at at, at distilling these complex scientific topics and, and making them actionable and achievable for people. Well, and, and that's the point. You know, like I, I think that a lot of scientists are super smart, but not necessarily comfortable in communicating what they know. And a lot of people who are communicators might not be scientists, so they they might know a certain aspect of it, but they're not they're they're they may be a, a mile wide but an inch deep. Mm. And so one of the things that I have the privilege, and I really think about it that way, of doing is that I'm doing the actual work, so I'm a mile deep. But I happen to enjoy communicating to people. So for people that want like my immune blueprint, all you got to do is go to my website, drdrwilliamleeli.com. Download it's free. I want people to actually get it so they can see that. You can love your health and love your food at the same time because all these foods taste great. Yeah. What are some other ways to to fortify the, that that gut bacteria, the colonic the colonic ecosystem? You mentioned dietary fiber. Where where can we find dietary fiber? Are all dietary fibers created equally? I mean, you mentioned pears, but surely pears aren't the only option for people. Right. Right. Well, I I, I mentioned pears because pears are among fruit um, uh, unusually high in dietary fiber. Interesting. Right. I didn't know that. Um, another fruit that's actually pretty high in dietary fiber that you might not expect is the kiwi. Hmm. I okay. love kiwi. Oh, I'm totally into kiwis, right? Do you eat it with the skin on? Uh, I have. Uh, and, the, and the skin has a ton of dietary fiber. Now, people sometimes, you know, don't like the texture of the skin, but, you know, you can actually blend that into a smoothie. It becomes invisible. Okay, people so- listening to this or watching this, try ki- if you haven't ever tried kiwi with the skin on, Eat it with the skin. It's the only way that I eat it. It's the best. It it offers a little bit of like a a, a zest, for like a tangy. Well, you flavor. get it. You get it. You you get you extract all the dietary fiber out of it. So you know it's really good for your gut microbiome. And here, uh, you know, and obviously, you know, I could give you the obvious uh, foods that have a lot of dietary fiber. So you take a look at um, kale and cauliflower and Brussels sprouts and Swiss chard. Uh, and spinach, you know, those are the things that you might expect. And and celery have a lot of kale. So you know, the gar the the salad bar kind of things, the produce section, the green section, and and there's lots of great greens to go for. But I want to talk about some surprises, right? So like the kiwis, a surprise, and pear to me was a little surprise. Here's a real surprise: mushrooms. Mm. Mushrooms are loaded with dietary fiber, soluble dietary fiber, which means it dissolves. Okay. You can't even see it. It's not stringy. Okay. That's insoluble fiber, but the soluble fiber dissolves. And even the ordinary white button mushroom has dietary fiber in it. So I'll tell you a a, a little kind of like a a, a little pro tip. If you go out and buy a a white button mushroom, what do you do when you get home with it? Right? So you're going to, you're going to put it on the cutting board you're going to take a knife. You're going to cut the stem off, move the stem aside, then you got to eat the cap, right? So now you slice the cap up cook it, saute it, put it in a salad, whatever you're gonna do. Now, stems uh, often get thrown away. So I did a research project where we actually looked at the amount of dietary fiber and bioactives in uh, mushrooms. And there's plenty in the cap of the mushroom, but there's twice as much of the bioactive, a beta-glucan, the dietary fiber in the stem, the stipe. Wow. So don't throw that away, be sustainable, use the anatomy of the food. Do not throw the mushroom stem away. Save it, blend it, make it into a soup, whatever it is. It's got tons of fiber. It's really, really good for you. So what are some of the things that, like I told you, white button mushrooms are good? I always say, what's the best possible food? Like, give me, tell me the super mushroom. What's the mushroom that's got the most, right? So I'll tell you. So uh, four or five times more dietary fiber, beta-glucan, than a white button mushroom is the oyster mushroom. Okay, um, or shiitake mushroom also has almost as much, or crimini mushroom. And if you go to the porcini mushroom, which is a kind of a culinary delicacy, you can find dry or fresh um, or frozen. Um, it has kind of a middle amount. So again, start with a bite button mushroom. That's kind of the baseline. That's a good uh, kind of like a beginners for dietary fiber. Then you can march your way up. And as you go up, you go through chanterelle. You go to 
um, porcini, then you go into shiitake and go through enoki mushrooms, you wind up actually getting to experience this whole range of delicious mushrooms out there that every food culture in the world has some mushroom in their traditional recipes. And every traditional health culture has used mushrooms actually as part of their healing. That's amazing. There's a there's a study that I reference um, when talking when when giving speeches. They there was a, an elderly cohort that found uh, that showed a twenty percent um, risk reduction for dementia for regular consumers of mushrooms, and it was only something I forget the exact uh, the exact proportion, but it was like you know thirty to fifty grams of mushrooms a week or something like that. It was like not very much, not very much. And here's a, here's another pro tip that I'll throw in: don't rinse your mushrooms because mu- mushrooms are like little sponges, and the goal of cooking them is to actually get the water that's already in them out of them. Just brush off any visible dirt or debris. Um, don't rinse them, and then and then cook accordingly. Much you're going to be have much better brush, mushrooms. And to brush them, here's another little tip to add on to yours: uh, you can go online and order something called a truffle brush. Um, it's actually what people use for these super expensive truffles, which are a delicacy, but you can use them for mushrooms. And so basically it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a brush for your shoe, except smaller. It's perfect. Like there's, there, there are bristles that are, that, that won't damage it. And you can just literally take it to your mushroom and brush off all the dirt. I love that. What about, I mean, I, I feel like something that doesn't get discussed, uh, often enough when talking about when, when making blanket recommendations to eat more fiber is the fact that when you dramatically and suddenly increase your fiber intake, it can lead to bloating and gas, which I think a lot of people already struggle with that. So how do we reconcile that, Dr. Lee? You know, um, one way to feel less bloated is, I, I like to go for simple things. One way to feel less bloated is to eat more slowly, eat less quickly, eat more slowly, and eat less. If we're actually being very moderate with our diet, you know that old Japanese saying "harahachi banmi," which is which basically means stop eating when you're eighty percent full. Mm. Don't finish a meal only when you're don't don't get off the table when you're only when you're stuffed. Okay, listen. When you eat slowly, you intuitively know when your your body's going to tell you because actually your gut sends signals to your brain to say, "Ah, oh, you know we're we're kind of full. We're good. We're good." When you're 80% full and and slowing down, if you eat slowly, then just stop. And you'll be much less likely to feel bloated because you're not loading, overloading your body. You're not overloading your body with with roughage. You're not overloading with fiber. You're not overloading with fluid either. The people who tend to feel bloated most easily are people that are stuffing food down as quickly as they can. The other thing is that, you know, bloating is, it may also be not just connected to the food that you've eaten, but that sensation may not be, you know, the bloating is like gas, right? That you think we think it's gas, but it could be just the bacterial ecosystem is having a conniption because it's not quite healthy, Mm. right? And so it's sort of having a barroom brawl in your gut because it's not that healthy. And so this is the reason why you want to, and it may be, by the way, even if you think you're eating fiber, it could be that you're eating other things that are damaging your gut microbiome. We already talked about this, red meat, ultra processed meats, too much sugar, too much alcohol, ultra processed foods. I mean, think about, it. I just listed things that are very, very common in people's diets, not even talking about overeating, okay? Um, and so our, our gut bacteria, the, the holobionts that are us, very sensitive, you know, they're, they're, that's a sensitive group of organisms. And so when we're not feeling that great, I think number one, ask, is there something that you're eating that you're doing that might not be so good for your gut? Maybe stay away from that for a while. Are we feeding our gut the right things? And then of course, you know, you talked about, um, or you wanted me to talk about like, uh, what are some foods that you can actually, uh, that, are probio- that are probiotic that actually have bacteria? Well, you know, again, I, 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 and this is what I'm writing about my next book is sort of, you wanna, you wanna think about um, culinary traditions going back hundreds or thousands of years. And this is where food, you know, before there were refrigerators, because there was no electricity, we had fermentation that actually preserved our food. And that's basically how food was carried around the Silk Road. Okay. You know, from China to the Mediterranean, the people had it on their caravans on their back. They're taking their food with them. Uh, uh, and that's fermented food. And, and, and I don't know how many people have, have you ever fermented anything? I used to brew my own kombucha. 
I grew my own scoby, which I did. I didn't spend any, all I did was I bought a bottle of kombucha and I used that to grow a scoby from cool. scratch. Cool. Well, I mean, you know, I think a lot of people um, uh, don't realize that it's like getting a house plant. You tend to it and then you can actually, you know, have it serve another function. And fermenting is is literally if you take a cabbage and you slice it up and you put some salt water on it, you lay expose it to the air. Bacteria drop out of the air and they grow on it, which sounds kind of disgusting, except <laughs> that the nature of fermentation that humans learned over thousands of years is that over time, if you're in the right kind of cool environment, good bacteria will outgrow the bad bacteria. And then you cap it up and you stick it in the fridge or someplace cool, and it'll wind up fermenting and creating lactic acid and all this other stuff that makes sauerkraut as an example or makes kimchi as an example. And you know, as tasty as those things are, they're also filled with good bacteria that help to replenish the gut. This, by the way, is different than the Greyhound bus dropping off people to and try to enter your homes in a quiet neighborhood. Hmm. That's the probiotic approach. The, the, the <clears throat> kimchi sauerkraut approach actually is, is more like inviting uh, your relatives from other towns to come into the neighborhood. Some of them might actually hang out overnight and stay overnight or maybe stay for a week or two. Right. And, and, be, and it's, and it's because it's the natural bacteria that's in the air. Yeah. I love that. Um, I, I have to ask, cause you mentioned it twice, the, the, the role that red meat plays in the, in the, in the microbiome red meat. Uh, I mean, as far as I know, it's, it's a, it's a low residue food. I mean, it's, it's, it's absorbed, metabolized, high up in the, in the small intestine. Like, uh, so, so what, uh, what is the effect as you see it, that red meat has on the microbiome and is, is in your eyes, does, does quality matter or is it, is this just sort of a blanket, um, opinion? Yeah. Well, look, first of all, I, I want to actually say that I'm an omnivore, so I'm not a vegan and I do eat meat, although I would say mostly I eat plants. Uh, so I'm not one of those people that, you know, is trying to bludgeon red meat. Okay. <laughs> um, so, um, and appreciate fact, the disclosure, the disclosure, what I, what I actually tell people to do is that, you know, like this is my, my, my honest, uh, opinion about this is that, you know, life's all about choices. We don't always make the best choices for our health, but sometimes we really want to do something. And if you really love red meat, what I always tell people is don't eat it too often, but when you eat it, don't go for the red meat substitute, go for the real thing, mm. get the best piece you can. Okay. And really love the heck out of it. OK, like really enjoy it. Knock yourself out. Just don't knock yourself out every single day. All right. And, and don't go for the cheap stuff. Go for a better, better, better quality, better cut. Like so if you're going to have something that might not be that great for you, whether it's your heart. By the way, if you have it infrequently, it's probably fine as long as your body's health defenses are all in good shape anyway. And so, you know, I, I sort of I have a little bit of a different um, dance move when it comes to thinking about red meat, um, although, you know, processed meats are another story because. It, again, it's a blanket term, but processed meats in a chemical factory or, or a factory uses a lot of chemicals are different than air dried uh, uh, meats that might be cured in a different way. So we do have to, I'm glad you pointed that we do have to be careful about how we talk about this. Now, let's talk about red meat in the microbiome. I don't really know the mechanism for that, to be honest with you. Um, uh, and, and the reason that this has been studied is they've looked at people who um, uh, are eating mostly vegetarian diets, and then they give them red meat to eat, then they look in their poop, and they look for the changes in the bacteria, and they start seeing some of the harmful bacteria starting to grow in greater concentrations once they switch from a vegetarian or a, a, a diet into a red meat diet. So it doesn't mean that red meat is really awful for you, but there are, are, there's, there are studies that show that it changes your gut microbiome, and maybe a little bit more towards the, the, the types of organisms that are not so good that that tend to release more noxious substances. Now, yeah. the other thing is most people don't eat red meat like a zombie. Okay, you know you're, we're not just like clawing into sinews and tendons um, and muscle. It's cooked, and don't forget when you're you got a steak on the grill or marinated in something that might have all kinds of chemical preservatives. All right, you're also eating that along with the red meat, and so it could be some of the things that we cook with red meat actually are also damaging, like the TMAOs and other types of chemical residues that can accompany certain kinds of meat the way we cook it. 
That's yeah, that that's fair. I would be curious to see in that in like those crossover experiments if they because you would when they switch over to the to the meat arm of the of the trial, do they then reduce the plant material that they're feeding the meat with? I would like to know if they're giving them like a high vegetable diet and then they switch them over to a high vegetable diet plus meat or if they're switching them over to a high vegetable diet. And then comparing that to their stool on an all meat diet, because right. that would obviously change the results. And it wouldn't necessarily be reflective of somebody who's eating a vegetable rich diet along with high quality meat. Right. Right. And, you know, I think you're, you're right. Those are the experiments that those are the studies that are that deserve to be done. And so I'm glad we're having, you know, this particular part of the conversation. It just goes to show you that, you know, like if we're going to sit down and actually kind of think through why something might be happening and review some studies that have been done and come up with other ideas and new studies that could be done. That's an intelligent conversation. But when you have two people at two ends of the table shouting at each other, yeah. saying that, you know, you should only eat rabbit food and you should only eat, you know, red meat, you could only be a carnivore, you know, like that, not, that's not how we make progress. That's not how we understand um, the process or each other. No, I agree. I think I think nuance is so important. And, and also, I like to encourage my listeners and viewers to be able to think like that. Right. I'm not a, I'm not a trained scientist, but it's it's 10 years in this field at this point um, where you you develop that lens. Right. That lens of skepticism and, 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 and critical thinking. And by the way, the other things that influence our gut microbiome and therefore our immune system uh, uh, as two of our body's health defenses are um, physical activity. So you don't actually have to be training for a marathon, um, but you have to stay in motion. Our bodies were designed to stay in motion. You know, it's kind of like the car that you park in the garage, like your cars are meant to be driven. If you don't drive your car for a couple of months, you know, you're away for the summer, you come back. What happens when you try to back your car to the garage? All you hear is squeaking and creaking, <laughs> right? Because everything is kind of fossilized. Same thing for our health defenses. When you're not moving, they're not doing all they can be doing. It's not quite right. And the other thing is sleep. Good quality sleep is an area where our health defenses regenerate, whether it's our microbiome or whether it's our, um, uh, our immune system. I was just talking uh, yesterday to somebody about things that happen uh, invisibly in our sleep. And do you know about the glymphatic system? Oh, man, I'm, I'm familiar, but uh, please share. So one of the things that I found so amazing is how much we're discovering about human anatomy after thousands of years, we're still discovering new organs and new parts of our body. I mean, how could we be discovering new body parts, right? Like that's ridiculous. Amazing. Yet, a few years ago, we discovered a new brain cell called the rose hip neuron. This rose hip neuron prevents depression, it looks seems like, by um, preventing some of those neurotransmitters that are associated with depression. So when you don't have rose hip neurons, the depressive symptoms actually seem to take over. This is state-of-the-art research. Um, but the other day, uh, this is actually this like last week, it was a publication that showed new channels discovered in the human skull. What? Wow. How did we discover new channels in the human skull? Like, haven't we dissected the heck out of the human skull? <laughs> yeah, you know? Grey's Anatomy. Right. Last, last week? Last week. Wow. They discovered these channels that connect blood vessels in the skull to the mm -hmm. brain and what we and through the lymphatic system, and we believe that this this is actually a communication between our immune system and the brain. Hmm. So it's an area that our immune cells can go through our skull through these little channels and communicate to our brain through our lymph system. Now let's go back to look at the gut. If the gut's connected to the immune system and the immune system goes through these channels into the brain, maybe there's a whole new act, way of act, for the gut bacteria for the gut brain axis to be working. Back to the glymphatics, because these are lymphatic channels. This is what we're discovering. There's a whole new um, uh, system in the brain. You know, like, have you ever, have you ever been to Paris, the city of Paris? Beautiful city. Beautiful city. And, you know, it's beautiful above ground, but most people don't realize there's this incredible sewer system underneath Paris that is incredibly, like, it's architecturally thought out. It functions like you can't believe, and it's been there for hundreds of years. Now, same thing in our brain. There is a hidden uh, sewer system called the glymphatic system that is completely collapsed during the day when we're awake. When we're awake, this sewer system is completely smashed up to each other. 
can't see it, can't find it. And by the way, the reason that we never saw it uh, over do, doing anatomy is that, you know, when pathologists were doing autopsies on people who had died and open up and look in their brain, they're dead. The channels are collapsed. Wow. Can't find it. But now that we can use scans like PET scans and other kinds of scans, and we can label and different tracers, what we find is when you're sleeping, when you fall asleep in REM sleep, not in light sleep, but really good deep sleep, okay, and the kind that you get when you sleep for eight hours, these channels open up, your brain expands, like there's 60% more circulation inside your brain. They open up like the sewers of Paris, underground. And what they do is they allow your brain to dump all the toxins that accumulated during the day. Oh my God. Dump them out of your brain. If you don't get good sleep, you're not completely emptying away the toxins. If you don't get deep sleep, the glymphatic channels don't open. So now let's think about this, right? Um, why do we feel so crappy? Why are we so woozy after pulling an all-nighter mm. or not getting good night's sleep, right? Now you're starting to, to, to see some of these new discoveries. So anyway, that, you know, like we started off this thing talking about like, okay, how incredible the human body is. And I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to touch on some of the highlights of new things that are coming out that are amazing to me. It's so exciting. Yeah. I mean, so, so what are some of the other consequences then of, of not getting adequate sleep on a chronic basis? I mean, that sounds like a big deal. If you're, if you're not, if you're disallowing your brain to purge itself from toxins that accumulate over the course of the day, that sounds like a, 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 a pretty big deal. Well, think about it. I mean, you know, clinically it's associated not getting good sleep is associated with uh, higher rates of depression or uh, exacerbation of schizophrenia or uh, triggering bipolar disorder uh, or uh, impaired cognition. Wow. You know, I mean, and by the way, think about all the medications that we might be taking that might be interfering with our sleep as well. But then let's go back and take a look at, you know, how our dietary uh, impact as well. Like, I mean, you know, I, I, this is something that's interesting to think about, you know, people that drink coffee late at night. Okay. Um, does that impact your, their clearing of purging of toxins mm. or what about people that work night shifts? All right. So like, do, are they purging when they sleep during the day? We don't know that. These are all the new questions that are being asked. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here and I'll see you there. How did it start to get sick? until first, second grade. And I'm talking like hormonal issues, horrible migraines, I had a headache every day from second grade to age 25, ER visits constantly because I'd be throwing up and, and pass out. 